Hello, friends. It's Monday, Thursday. And as you can see, I'm coming to you here from our church library. And while I wish we could be together in the sanctuary on this day, wish we could be worshiping in one room, singing together with one voice, hearing the scriptures read, praying prayers of thanks to God, sharing in the Lord's Supper today, we can't. But yet, through the beauty of technology, we can still come together, and we can still study, and we can still worship. For this Monday, Thursday, I'm going to be looking at John chapter 13. And so I ask right now for you to do me a favor. Would you just pause this video for a moment? Would you go get your Bible out? Would you open it to John 13 so that we can study along together? Now let me set up this passage for you. It is Thursday of Passover. Jesus and his disciples and most likely other friends and family members have gathered together in an upper room in Jerusalem. There they are going to celebrate the Passover meal together. Judas has already conspired with the religious leaders to portray Jesus but yet he is there with them. And John, who was there as an eyewitness to everything that was happening, writes these words that I'm starting in verse three. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. Now, foot washing was a common practice in Jesus' times. Roads were just dirt. Many animals traveled along them and left, well, you know what they left. The people of the day, they wore sandals made of leather and rope. The Middle Eastern sun would cause people's feet to sweat. And so that, with the three Ds, dirt and dust and dung, all on sweaty feet, made them well. You can just imagine what it made them. Now, when you would enter the home as so of someone as their guest, you came in with your filthy, dirty, stinky feet. Now you might have your guest take their shoes off when they enter your home, but when you take off sandals, feet, they're still dirty. And so the custom was to have a servant, or if not the servant, the person with the lowest social standing wash the feet of guests in the house. But John tells us that Jesus, the guest of honor, he's the one who washes the feet. But that just doesn't make sense. I mean, here is Jesus. He is the rabbi, the teacher. He is a well-known figure. He is the one who has healed people of sickness and illness. He's the one who fed the 5,000, who calmed the storms. He's the one who just raised Lazarus from the dead. I mean, on Sunday, as Jesus made his way into the city, the people were ready to anoint him king. He is the last person that you would expect to be washing people's feet. But that's exactly what Jesus does. He washes the feet of the disciples the other guests that are there. He even washes the feet of Judas. Now John tells us when he comes to Peter, Peter protests. He says, Jesus, there is no way that you are going to wash my feet. 
But Jesus tells him, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you can have no part in what I'm doing. And so Peter, and I'm paraphrasing here, he says, well then master, not just my feet, wash my head, wash my hands, wash all of me. But Jesus tells him, Peter, a person who needs a bath only needs to wash their feet. The rest of them is clean. And then Jesus says something else. He looks at him and says, and most of you are clean, but not all of you. But Jesus wasn't referring to hygiene in that statement. He was referring to holiness. For he knew that Judas was going to betray him. John tells us, after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I am doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash others' feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Friends, I want you to think about something for a moment. Jesus' hands. The same hands whom through the sun and the moon and the stars were created. The same hands that formed the mountains, that carved up the land, that scooped out the oceans. The same hands that created the birds and the animals and the fish. The same hands that formed Adam from the dust of the ground, wash stinky, smelly, dirty feet. Why? Well, friends, it's because Jesus, God the Son, didn't come to be served, but came to serve. Paul in Philippians puts it this way, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Well, after Jesus washes the disciples' feet, he tells them something troubling. He tells them that one of them is going to betray him. John tells us, the disciples looked at each other, wondering who he could mean. The disciple Jesus loved, that's John who's writing all this, was sitting next to Jesus at the table. Simon Peter motioned to him and asked, who is he talking about? So the disciple leaned over to Jesus and asked, Lord, who is it? John tells us that Jesus then takes a piece of bread and he dips it in a bowl, most likely filled with olive oil. He hands that piece of bread to Judas, signifying that Judas is the one who is going to betray him. But this is something weird. All the disciples seem to totally miss what Jesus is doing. Judas then gets up from the table and leave, and the disciples think that He's maybe going to buy more food because Judas was the treasurer after all. But then John writes this. As soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, the time has come for the son of man to enter into his glory and God will be glorified because of him. And since God reveals, receives glory because of the son, he will give 
his own glory to the Son, and he will do so at once. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I have told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I am going. Jesus knew his death would soon be approaching. In fact, in less than 24 hours, Jesus would be dead in the tomb. But Jesus also knew that through his death and through his resurrection, God will be glorified. But before his death and resurrection took place, Jesus wanted to give his disciples one last teaching, one last instruction. And in giving it to them, he gives it to us too. He wanted to give them something vital, something important. He wants to give to them a new command. In fact, it's this that we get the name for this evening. You see, the word mande comes from the Latin mandatum, which means command. It's where we get our English word mandate. And so Jesus tells them, so I am giving you a new command. Love each other. Wait, love one another? Jesus, that's not really a new command. Jesus, you have been teaching us to love one another from the very beginning. The Old Testament talks about loving one another. Jesus, what do you mean a new command, love one another? And so Jesus tells them, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Jesus said, just as I have loved you, you should love one another. And so friends, how did Jesus love? Well, if we wanna know how Jesus loved, let's look to the gospels and see what he did. In that room, I'm sure he looks at Matthew and he says, Matthew, do you remember when I met you? You were a tax collector. You were the scum of the earth. And I loved you. I told you, come, follow me. I even went to dinner at your house that night. And who was there? Other tax collectors. Or disciples. Remember when we went through Samaria? Of course you remember when we went through Samaria because none of you wanted to go through Samaria. And remember how I sent you off to the village, but when you came back, you found me sitting by a well talking to a Samaritan woman? A Samaritan woman with that reputation? And what did I do? I loved her. I showed compassion on her. I forgave her. And because of her, many in Samaria became my followers. Do you remember how I loved that guy with leprosy? Nobody would come near him, but I touched him and healed him. Remember Jairus' daughter? She was dead and people said, don't bother Jesus anymore. But because of my love and compassion, she was raised from the dead. Would you recall, disciples, what you did when those little kids came to me? You yelled at their parents, don't let the kids bother Jesus. But what did I do? What did I tell you? Luke 18, 16. Let the little children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these. Or how about all of Jesus' interactions with those disciples? 
How many times did they mess up? How many times did they miss what he was teaching them? Most rabbis would have given up on them long ago, but not Jesus. He loved them, he cared for them, he was always forgiving of them, was always pouring into them. Slaves are not greater than the master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you are to love one another. The world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. But John tells us as Jesus is giving the disciples these new commandments, it seems like Peter, he's not paying attention at all. He spent the whole time thinking about what Jesus said when he said he's not going to be with them much longer. Because do you want to know how Peter responds to this? Verse 36. Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. But why can't I come now, Lord, he asked. I am ready to die for you. Jesus answered, die for me? I tell you the truth, Peter. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. Friends, Peter was busy thinking about something else that he missed it. When Jesus told him that he couldn't go with him, Peter was so emphatic. Peter said, Jesus, I'm even willing to die for you. And Jesus says, die for me? Tonight before the rooster crows, you're going to deny that you even know me three times. And it got me thinking. With everything happening, with everything going on in our world, I don't want us to be like Peter. To be thinking about something else and miss what God has for us on this Monday, Thursday. And so I ask you, right now, Would you please listen to what I have to say? Friends, Jesus showed love and compassion. How? The sick were cured. The lame and injured healed. Those in bondage by demonic powers were set free. The unwelcomed, the outcast, those who were declared scum, were told that they were loved, that they were valuable to God. Jesus respected women, he respected children, he respected the downtrodden and the poor. And while Jesus showed love and compassion, please don't miss this out, Jesus still called sin what it was, sin. Remember how he told the woman caught in adultery to go and sin no more? But Jesus' greatest demonstration of love for all of us was that he died so that our sin could be forgiven. He went to a cross so that our sins could be washed away, so that we could have a restored relationship with God the Father. The truth is, I don't know who is watching this right now, or where you are in the country and the world as you watch it. 
The truth is the amazing thing about technology is that this message could travel all over the world. And maybe you don't know me and maybe you don't know St. Luke here in Cheektowaga, New York in the suburbs of Buffalo. But maybe you're watching this today and maybe you need to know this. Jesus loves you. He does. Warts and all, he loves you. And I don't care what people have said or what society have said or what even a church or a pastor has said. The scriptures tell us that Jesus loves you. The truth is we've all sinned. We've all messed up. We've all done things wrong. And Jesus didn't give up on us or abandoned us. No, he came to die so that our sins could be forgiven. He's promised everyone, and I mean everyone, 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 that they can have eternal life in him. All we need to do is through the power of the Holy Spirit accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. For some of you watching this, maybe you needed to hear that today. Maybe today is the day that you know that Jesus loves you so much. Today is the day that you accept him as Lord and Savior. Today is the day that you start a new journey in life knowing that you are forgiven, that there is a God who loves and cares for you. I know that many of you watching this video, you are a Christian. You are a follower of Jesus Christ, and I thank God for that. And so this is what I encourage us to do. Let's do what Jesus did. Let's show the world we are his disciples by loving one another. And how do we do that? We show care and compassion for others. We walk alongside them when they are struggling, when they're hurting, when they need us. We call sin what it is, sin, but then we remind people that Jesus died for it and can forgive it. And that he loves you and welcomes you. For Jesus told us, a new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, you are to love one another. The world will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. In Jesus' holy name, let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come together on this Monday, Thursday, first of all, Lord, I just pray for the people hearing this message here today that do not know you as Lord and Savior, who've been told that they're not worthy, that God will never love someone like them, that they're like Matthew scum. Jesus, you came because you love everyone and you died so that all could be forgiven. Lord, everyone can have the hope of eternal life through a relationship with you and Lord, Holy Spirit, I pray that you're with people today, that they can come to you for salvation. 
Lord, for those of us who call ourselves Christians, those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, Lord, let us prove to the world that we are your disciples. Let us love one another. God, let us use the gifts and the talents that you have given us to show compassion and mercy on others, to give people the hope that is salvation in Jesus Christ. And on this Monday, Thursday, Lord Jesus, we give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory and worship in your holy name. Amen. I thank you for joining me on this Monday, Thursday. I pray that the Lord's blessings be with you this day and for all the days to come. In Jesus' name, amen.